Catherine Mears was born on December 30, 1982, in Bayshore, New York. When she was just two months old, her mother, Marilyn Mears, abandoned her at her friend Linda Ingleri's house. Katie then moved in with Linda, her husband Sal Ingleri, and their son, Little John. If it wasn't enough that she was neglected and abandoned her by her mother, when Catherine was just two years old, she began to be abused by Sal, Linda's husband. Katie also went to suffer psychological abuse from her godmother. When she was about five years old, Linda made her do various household chores, such as cooking dinner, washing the dishes, doing the laundry, cleaning the whole house, and even sending her to the market by herself to buy cigarettes. Catherine was treated like a slave, and if she didn't obey, she was punished. Katie went to school only two or three times a week, and her teachers and other school staff knew about her girl's reality, but did nothing to help her. There was only one person Catherine trusted, and that person was a man named John Esposito. John was very close to Linda and Sal. He was a very dear friend to the family, as he always helped the couple when they needed it. He also used to buy Catherine ice cream and toys, and in this way, he ended up gaining the girl's trust. On December 28, 1992, Two days before Catherine's 10th birthday, John bought a Barbie dream house as a gift and went to her house to give it to her. Arriving there, he asked Linda if he could take Catherine to an amusement park, as it was close to her birthday. Since John was a good friend, Linda thought it would be nice if he took her for a walk, so she let Catherine go. After John took Catherine to play in the park, they went for ice cream and finally stopped at a toy store, where John bought her some video games. John bought these video games because he knew that the only place Katie could play was at his house, as the girl didn't have a console. Right after, he invited her to his house. Very excited about the new games, she accepted without hesitation. Once there, John showed Catherine the house and then took her to a large room, full of games, toys, snacks and soft drinks, a dream for any child. This room was also the main bedroom in the house, where John slept. John sat on the bed and pulled Katie onto his lap. He covered her mouth and told her not to scream so he wouldn't hurt her. Then, he raped her. After that, John took her to his office, and in a moment of distraction, Catherine tried to pick up the phone and call the police. But John noticed and immediately took the phone from her, and then locked her inside a closet that was behind a bookshelf. Behind that closet was a concrete trapdoor that weighed about 200 pounds and could only be opened by a hinge mechanism that John had built. He opened this trapdoor and sent Candy down with a four-foot ladder. Very scared, she refused, so he threw her down and pushed her through a tunnel about two meters long. At the end of the tunnel, there was a small door that gave access to an underground bunker. It was a dirty and dark room. It had a very dim lamp, a toilet, a mattress, a TV, handcuffs, and a big chain. The day he kidnapped Katie, John devised a plan whose goal was to make him above suspicion. First, he forced Katie to call Linda, her adoptive mother, and say that she had been kidnapped by a man with a knife. Then he went to the police and reported the girl's disappearance, claiming that he was distracted for a moment and when he looked, she was no longer there. Although John had planned this very carefully, thinking that no one would suspect him, the police found his story very strange. For them, something was odd about John's story. His procedure then became the main suspect. Dominic Varone, the detective in charge of Catherine's case, was certain that John was responsible for her disappearance. He looked up for John's file and found that he had already been arrested for trying to kidnap a seven-year-old from a mall. This information caused Detective Dominic's suspicions to increase regarding John Esposito. He then decided to go to John's house with a team of police and they searched the entire place, but found nothing. John only entered the bunker once a day to feed Catherine. Her only company was the TV, where she watched reports of her own disappearance. Katie was a very smart girl. Once John dropped the key inside the bunker, without him noticing, she hid the key under the pillow, thinking that maybe at some point it might be of some use. On another occasion, Catherine heard voices and started screaming for help. John got very angry and trapped her in the chain that was in the bunker. When John left, she tested a key she had hidden and was able to open the chain lock. John kept her trapped the entire time, so every time he left, she took the opportunity to let go. On December 30, 1992, two days after her disappearance and her birthday, Katie sang happy birthday to herself. This showed that despite her situation, the girl stood firm as many in her place would surely have gone mad. As John was aware that the police were suspicious of him, he became more cautious. That way, he didn't have direct contact with Katie for days 
and only went into the bunker to leave food for the girl. Catherine saw the situation as an opportunity for her to come up with a plan. She knew that John loved her, even if in an unhealthy way, and she also knew that she would never be found. She then thought of a way to use John's feelings to her advantage and find a way to escape that place. Katie started asking questions that seemed innocent to John, but her real intention was to test him. She asked how she was going to school. He replied that he would teach her everything she needed to know. Asked how she was going to work. He said she wouldn't need it, as he already had enough money for both of them. He also asked how he would get married and have children. He replied that when she turned 18, that she would marry and have a beautiful family. On January 14, 1993, 17 days after her kidnapping, Catherine pretended that she was very sick and that she had never felt this way before and that maybe she couldn't make it. John, very concerned that Catherine might die, called his lawyer and subsequently turned himself in. He took the police to the bunker and Catherine was rescued. The bunker was 1.80 by 2.30 meters. The walls were lined with a soundproof material and despite having a box with a pipe that took care there, it was very hot and stuffy. In his testimony, John Esposito told the police that the bunker was built years before the kidnapping and that construction took about a year. He also said that he built it specially for Catherine and the entrance was inside his house and ended up under his garage. John Esposito pleaded guilty on June 16, 1994 to first-degree kidnapping. As part of a plea deal with the prosecution for turning himself in, he was sentenced to 15 years in prison without parole. In September 2013, aged 63, John Esposito was found dead in his cell. According to the coroner, he died of natural causes. Sal Inglary, Catherine's adopted father, was sentenced to 12 years in prison for abusing her. He served his sentence until 2006, but was arrested again for another crime in 2007. In February 2009, at age 55, he died in prison of a heart attack. Marilyn Beers, mother of Katie and Linda Ingalari, adoptive mother, despite abandonment, neglect and mistreatment, were not charged with any crime. Shortly after being rescued, Katie was adopted and moved to New Hampton, a small town in Orange County, New York. She underwent intense therapy and later returned to school, adapting very well to her new life. Katie Beers later said in an interview that being kidnapped was probably one of the best things that ever happened to her, because thanks to this kidnapping, after being released, she was adopted by her new family, who, according to her, saved her from a childhood of abuse and mistreatment, giving her lots of love and a great life. Today, Katie is married and lives in rural Pennsylvania with her husband and two children. At the age of 30, she wrote a book called Buried Memories, where she tells in detail her entire story that serves as an inspiration for other people who have gone through the same traumatic experiences as her. Well, folks, so that's it. Thanks for watching until the end, best wishes and I'll see you next time.